This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University. And today I wanted to answer the question, is the Fed done raising rates? Many of you have been asking for a macro video, so I just wanted to catch us up and see where we are in the Fed's rate cycle. But rather than asking me, I thought maybe we would just ask the Fed governors and presidents and chiefs themselves whether they are done. Fed's Williams suggests rate hikes may already be finished. Fed's daily rise in bond yields may mean Fed can stay on hold. Fed's Waller, Fed can watch and see if further hikes needed. So these are all very dovish comments. And even Jerome Powell himself in the most recent press conference, as people pointed out, have used the word careful and carefully 16 times. So it's almost like they're treading on eggshells now. And we can see the huge change in attitude just looking at Kashkari, the same guy who said that there's infinite money at the Fed or infinite dollars at the Fed. Just a couple of weeks ago, Kashkari was warning of the need for more and more rate hikes. That was on September 26th. He has markedly changed his tone as of October 10th. Kashkari is saying possible higher bond yields means Fed can do less. So what changed in the last few weeks? The big thing that really changed is we saw a spike at the far end of the yield curve, especially at the 10-year, which is really a, a benchmark rate. These are the 10-year U.S. government bonds called 10-year treasuries, and we can see how much they spiked, really decisively breaching the 4.5% level. This is brutal for mortgages. This is brutal for the, a highly leveraged economy as the U.S. has now. Here's a very interesting letter that was written to the Fed from the Mortgage Bankers Association, the MBA, National Association of Realtors, and National Association of Home Builders, pointing out the disruptions in the real estate market that these much higher rates and mortgage rates have caused. So the Fed's under a lot of pressure both from the people and from the government. We can see here that the interest on U.S. government debt has been going parabolic, and it's going to get much worse, as we're going to see in a minute. But before we go there, if you're enjoying this video so far, it would really help me out if you'd hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, leave a comment, and share this video with a friend. We can see that U.S. government spending, just paying the interest on the debt, has been going up markedly since the Fed started raising rates in 2022. And this is going to get much worse for the reason that in the next 12 months, the U.S. is going to have to roll much of its debt. According to this article, $7.6 trillion of its debt, dollars worth of its debt, is going to need to be rolled. And what this means is that the U.S. government issues new debt in order to pay off the maturing old debt. The U.S. never shrinks its debt levels because it's an out-of-control uh, institution. But what they do need to do, these, these new bonds are going to need to be financed at a much higher rate because they'll be issued at market rates, which are now closer to 4.5% at the 10-year and even higher and the closer part of the curve in the near end of the curve. And so what this means is when they roll this debt, they're going to have to pay a much higher interest rate, and this will continue to make uh, the interest on the debt, these interest payments skyrocket. So we're in a bit of a bad situation, but this is what happens when you try raising rates when the economy is so levered. So we still have debt to GDP at 120%. What the Fed really should have done is let inflation run hot for a little bit longer in order to get this level, uh, this debt to GDP ratio down. Now, inflation is bad for people. It disproportionately hurts the working class and the middle classes. But unfortunately, inflation is the only way out for an economy like the U.S. This is the path that's always taken. So it's just a question of when we're going to take this medicine. Are we going to take it this year? Or are we going to take it in a couple of years from now? But it's basically impossible to raise rates like Volcker did. There's no way we could ever get in the double digits under Powell because when Volcker was raising rates, we could see debt to GDP was closer to 30%. When it's this levered, when the economy is this levered, both at the government level and at the private sector level and at the household level, it becomes impossible to raise rates without blowing things up as we've seen. Now this move up in rates has taken place at the back end of the curve. So we can see here, these are US government treasury rates. At the beginning of the year, we can see they're about 4 and 3% all the way across. So here's the one month T-bill, three month T-bill, two year, uh, two year note, five year note, 10 year note, which is really the benchmark, and then the 30 year treasury. If we scroll down and look and see where this was in the middle of the summer, for example, let's say in July, the front end was close to 5.5% and the 10 year note was still in the 3%. But now what's happened in the past couple of weeks is that the front end has stayed roughly the same at around 5.5, 5.6%. 5 
and the 10-year note, the yields have massively increased. And this has put a lot of pressure on the economy, on the housing market, on mortgage rates, on the U.S. government financing itself as well. And so what another way of looking at that is we can look at the steepness of the yield curve or how inverted it is. This is a chart of U.S. 10-year note yield minus the one month yield or the yield on the one month uh, T-bill massively inverted as of uh, May of this year where the 10-year note was um, well well below the front end of the curve and we can see that this has has come in quite a bit as the uh, as yields have moved up for the 10-year note there's been a lot of uh, celebration among the Keynesians the war on inflation is over we want it very little cost this is a tweet from Paul Krugman and readers uh, added some nice context here saying that excluding food shelter energy and used cars is extremely misleading basically this is the new game among economists just exclude from the inflation number everything that everyone needs it's very difficult to live without food energy shelter and a car in the modern world so if you take all those things out inflation looks good again the fed just needs to manage to these manipulated numbers so that helps when paul krugman says that we won the war on inflation at very little cost he failed to mention that the fed blew up the entire u.s banking system in uh in march of this year and so he's missing that small fact another reason i think the fed is done besides all of the job boning that's been happening if you look at the context of war and not to say that we're entering a, a version of world war ii or world war three but if you look back in world war ii the way central banks manage the economies or manage the monetary policy during times of war is to peg interest rates much lower than they would otherwise be. This is an article from the Fed itself, from the Chicago Fed, talking about yield curve control, which has already taken place in the US, 1942 to 1951. And this article begins, in 1942, the Federal Reserve helped the US Treasury to finance war debt by pegging interest rates on short-term treasury bills at a fixed interest rate and capping rates on longer-term treasury securities. So to the extent that the US continues with these proxy wars, or we approach, heaven forbid, some sort of global war, you can expect central bank policy to be much more dovish and for interest rates to come down. This gives a lie to the whole neutrality of the Fed. We can see that when push comes to shove, the Fed and the U.S. Treasury collude. So what are the uh, futures, the Fed funds, futures markets pricing in? We can see that for November, they're basically pricing in a 94% chance that we stay, that Fed funds, which is the rate that the Fed can adjust at the front end of the curve. This is the overnight lending rate basically for banks. The current rate is 5.25 to 5.5%, and there's a 94% uh, chance probability that we stay there at the November Fed meeting. If we go back, if we go forward and look next year, we begin to see the possibility of rate cuts really beginning in March for the first time, a 16% or 17% chance that the Fed cuts rates by 25 basis points. We can see though that there's quite a bit of dispersion. There's still some people betting that the Fed will raise rates from here. And if we go out and look at, let's say the uh, closer to the end of next summer, we can see that the, the market is really all over the place with a 10% chance that the Fed cuts essentially uh, 75 basis points from here, 35% chance that it cuts 25 basis points. And just approximately, if you add these up, about a 25% uh, percent chance that the Fed stays uh, where it is today or raises interest rates from here. Why am I excited about this? Well, it's quite bullish for Bitcoin. Of course, Bitcoin doesn't need the Fed. Bitcoin will do well over the long term in spite of Fed policy because Bitcoin is the most sound money ever discovered or ever invented. But now what are the bullish, uh, the bullish catalysts for Bitcoin? We have the Fed basically being done, as I've argued in this video. We have the BlackRock Bitcoin spot ETF on the way. There was another milestone yesterday where the SEC said and signaled that it won't appeal the grayscale conversion. And uh, this made the Bloomberg analysts, Balkunas and Seifert, who've been really tracking this, they raised their odds of a Bitcoin spot ETF approval to 90% by January 10th. So it looks like this may be something that we're gonna get in this quarter or early next year. And when you combine this with the Bitcoin halving, which usually kicks off a very bullish part of the cycle for Bitcoin, currently assuming block time stays around 10 minutes per block, it can move a little bit up and down. We're looking at a halving date of April 24th, 2024. And then if block time's a little faster, on average, we'll, the range is sort of April 5th, 
to May 14th, but probably somewhere near the end of April. So we're really having, uh, having a confluence of factors here, a spot ETF approval, Fed being done, and possibly even cutting rates by this point by April or March of next year. And you combine this with the halving, and you really have some rocket fuel coming down the line for Bitcoin. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.